So I'm going to read um, three brief sections, and then we'll open it up to questions, and each of which kind of covers a, a different aspect of the experience of allergy. And I'll begin with the introduction. There are only two birthdays that stand out in my memory as distinct, chronologically certain events. One, my 16th birthday, when we watched Ferris Bueller's Day Off. That was the year my friend Elizabeth, while using the swing anchored to the underside of our second story deck, pushed off so hard that the whole shebang, girl, swing, unhooked chains, went sailing 20 feet out into the woods behind our house. Two, the year I got diagnosed with mononucleosis, too late to cancel an Italian-themed dinner party. So I stood in front of a stove for two hours, achy, gland-swollen, stone-cold sober, cooking pasta for two dozen while my friends went through six bottles of wine. That was undoubtedly my 21st birthday. Beyond that, it blends into a murky er party. Which years did we go to Chuck E. Cheese's? When did I get my Rainbow Bright doll? Which years were my father home? And which years had the army sent him off to the war college, Saudi Arabia, Bosnia? There is one constant in my birthday memories. When it came time for a cake, my mother would bring out whatever Sandra Friendly sweet she'd imagined. Some years it was sunflower margarine Rice Krispies treats, and some years it was an applesauce and cinnamon raisin bunt cake. I'd get my serving. Then we'd dish out the real dessert of cake or brownies or pie a la mode for everyone else. After singing, after blowing out candles, after the presents had been opened, after everyone had eaten, someone would say it. Now, don't kill the birthday girl. Which meant no kisses, no hugs, no touch of a hand or a mouth. From that point onward, anyone who touched me ran the risk of giving me hives or worse. Even today, it's a phrase I repeat as part joke and part prayer. Don't kill the birthday girl. It's the same at every holiday. My Uncle Jim is notorious for forgetting about my allergies, holding out a dish of ice cream and asking, want a bite? He's the fun bachelor uncle, the one who rides a motorcycle and would give a little girl a wind-up sewer rat complete with blinking red eyes as a Christmas gift. Once upon a time, it would fall on my mother to protect me at the end of the night when the aunts and uncles and cousins were making the rounds for goodbyes. Now, I step to the side on my own. Everyone understands why I avoid contact, yet I can't help but wish it wasn't their last impression of me before the long drive home. I am allergic to dairy, including goat's milk, egg, soy, beef, shrimp, pine nuts, cucumbers, cantaloupe, honeydew, mango, macadamias, pistachios, cashews, swordfish, and mustard. I'm also allergic to mold, dust, grass and tree pollen, cigarette smoke, dogs, rabbits, horses, and wool. But in particular, I am one of the more than 12 million Americans who has been diagnosed with food allergies, a figure that includes almost 4% and in the most recent study, almost 8% of all children. By the time I was five, my parents recognized they had to instill absolute protective instincts. The traditional admonition of don't accept candy from strangers became don't accept food, period. If I tried to obey and did not, as my mother always points out, my body played tattletale. But sharing snacks is one of those critical gestures of friendship for the under 10 set, right up there with trading bracelets or calling out someone's name during Red Rover, Red Rover. It didn't take long before I phoned home from the nurse's office dosed with Benadryl and snuffling through tears. It was just a potato chip, I said, mystified. One potato chip. 
A sour cream flavored potato chip looked the same as the plain kind I ate all the time. How was it that I could react to something I couldn't even see? Working on a report for my third grade class, I asked my allergist how the body recognized the invisible presence of milk. Imagine a workbench, Dr. Latkin said, the kind with different shaped holes for each block. I pictured my Fisher Price toy at home, though that was baby stuff. I'd long since moved on to cultivating a collection of She-Ra action figures. The workbench, he explained, was like a kind of cell that could produce an allergic reaction. Now, you've got your blood, he said. Little bits of food come floating down the bloodstream, like blocks. I nodded. If the shape of a block doesn't match the shape of a hole, he said, you won't have a reaction. But it didn't take much to change the shape of the block. For example, Cooked broccoli, he told me, might have a different shape than raw broccoli. I visualized little crowns of broccoli bobbing along in my blood, a forest put out to sea. If the shape of the food matches the shape of the hole, he said, your body tries to eliminate it. I pictured the red plastic hammer I had used to push each block through its hole. Wham, wham, wham. That's a reaction, he said. I stared at him wide-eyed. No wonder I got all hivey. Somewhere inside me, I was being hit with a hammer. It's not easy to explain allergies to a young child. My grasp of anatomy had a ways to go. This was also the age when I believed that boogers were small, simple-minded animals that spent their lives roaming inside your nose, cleaning up whatever they found by eating it. To blow snot, I thought, with a twinge of guilt, was to kill one. My classmates understood that my allergies made me different, though they weren't quite sure of the mechanics. They saw that I got out of sponge duty in the cafeteria because the slop water they used to wash down the tables was per perpetually contaminated with milk. On the rare days I could buy tater tots, I was allowed to cut in the hot line rather than parade past all the stations I couldn't touch. Knowing I couldn't buy candy out of the on-site vending machines, my mother every day packed four or five strawberry candies, little hard lozenges filled with jam, in my lunchbox, sugar capital that made me the kingpin of lunch group B. In some ways, it seemed like Allergy Girl had a pretty sweet deal. Thanks to my asthma, a frequent companion disease for allergies, when the other kids had to run the mile, I got to work the stopwatch and record times instead. One day, my friend Karen crossed the finish line and let her forward momentum carry her into me, knocking us both down. The stopwatch and clipboard went flying. As we lay in a sprawled heap, she proceeded to rub her cheek against my forearms over and over. What are you doing? I asked, panting for breath. Whatever you are, she said, I hope you're catching. I had to have medications within quick reach. Since we were instructed to leave backpacks behind when traveling around school, I became the only kid at Haycock Elementary to carry a purse, the first of many hauled around over the years. There was the pink one with blue trim, an all-time favorite, ruined on a hot day at the fun fair by a melted Jolly Rancher. There was Le Sports Sack, which I smugly informed my friends was a French label. There was the black leather hand-me-down from my mother, still packed with musty, folded squares of Kleenex that bore lipstick blots. Later in life, I would look on in awe at my friend's clutches and baguettes, I have never had a purse that wasn't wide enough for an EpiPen, deep enough for an inhaler, and complete with a zippered pocket for Benadryl. The plastic orange chairs used in our classrooms are not designed for purses. Their backrests have rounded down corners that offer no resistance to gravity. So whenever I twitched or stretched in my seat, the purse would fall to the linoleum, necessitating a backward reach that made it look like I was Passing a note, grab, hang, thunk, grab, 
hang, thunk. Picture a kid in thick lensed glasses, indigo dark jeans. My mother refused to buy that worn out stonewashed look. A beglittered t-shirt threaded through a plastic buckle loop that gave it an asymmetrical hem and a slap bracelet. Now add the purse of a 32 year old mother, complete with pills, tissues, safety pins, and too many pennies. That is the hybrid reality of a child with food allergies. I took refuge in books. My grandfather, a doctor, noticed my love of reading and began passing along his monthly Reader's Digest whenever I went to visit. I was fascinated by all the features, drama in real life, laughter the best medicine, even that diabolical word power quiz. But my runaway favorite was I Am Joe's I Am Jane's a series written from the point of view of various body parts as they experienced critical injury or illness. The author, J.D. Radcliffe, assuming the voice of Joe's back, had my full attention as he explained what it felt like to herniate, undergo a CT scan, and slip those little discs back into their proper lumbar positions. I adored these columns partially because they satisfied my flair for the dramatic, who didn't want Jane's thyroid or Joe's lungs? Their viscera were so much more interesting than mine. I was sure between the ages of eight and 12, I had experienced doubts with kidney stones, obsessive compulsive disorder, mammary cysts, which turned out to be breasts, and arrhythmia, lockjaw, retinitis pigmentosa, and though I was fuzzy on the details, prostate cancer. <laughs> There must have been days when my family regretted ever introducing me to Joe and Jane. Perhaps they realized that in the long run, after my initial hypochondria passed, these articles would teach me the elements of diagnosis, developing internal measures of what was normal and what was aberrant, understanding how individual symptoms related to a whole, and knowing when to ask for help. In other words, these articles taught me how to manage allergic reactions. Preteens aren't known for their self-awareness, but I had no choice. No adult could do the job for me. Reactions that started out indiscernible to the outside world could rapidly turn quite serious. I am Jane's funny feeling throat could transform in a matter of minutes to I am Jane's anaphylactic shock. 